Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for listening to another episode of Public Comment, a podcast devoted to philosophy and politics for critical, creative, and introspective thinkers. Today, I'm going to be talking about competition. It's quite a topic when you think about it. It ties directly into our very culture with our democracy and our capitalistic economy. And even as we think about, uh, even if we were not um, capitalistic or democratic, is it not a fact that one way or another, in conquest for power of some sort, that we tend to be bound to degrees of competition, whether they are more uncivilized and violent and anti-democratic, or we try to make it as objective and more democratic and capitalistic as you know, as we can. So there are some questions to address with respect to competition then. Is competition a good thing? Is competition inherently a bad thing? Are there aspects of competition we might be able to embrace? These are some of the things I want to address. Before I do, I want to give a quick couple of shout outs, if you will, and give a special thanks to my producers, my wife, Ashley O'Connor, and Montanez Stills, because without the assistance of these two people, literally this show could not be produced. And uh, this is my soul as we move second by second here that is uh, existing and this is a dream come true to be able to do this it may sound funny to you if uh, you're watching this live or if you're listening to this show before it's official takeoff as uber popular because one day it will be but the truth is there could probably be nothing that makes me happier than identifying my philosophical thoughts on things really through a more of an introspective style and really tracking how ideas on philosophical things develop and evolve. That's really what I, I like to do. And uh, I will be talking more about introspection in the future. I did just come across an interesting philosopher who teaches at the University of Arkansas. His name is Dr. Jesse Butler, who actually recently wrote a book called Rethinking Introspection. I'm interested in the question of introspection as a method of gaining philosophical insights and knowledge and what Uh, how our culture assigns a a value on that at this point in time, and questions of what, in fact, we may actually be able to glean from that. But that's another time. I don't really want to get into that too much, but I just sort of want to put that out there. And again, special thanks to my producers, and also special thanks to Matthew Snope, fellow philosopher who has really uh, pushed me along with his encouragement. And thank you to Johnny Kashmir, who has really served in the capacity of a marketing consultant and uh, an advisor of sorts, and uh, whose uh, generous insights I just couldn't uh, advance without. And I also owe, I mean, there is a number of gratitudes that I owe, and I will be opening up to you sort of more and more about these as sort of 
do a sort of more comprehensive and focused evaluation of the various roles that um, exist in making this podcast and vlog possible. Uh, but uh, this is we're we're in a very public comment is in a very interesting period right now because it, it's literally in its process of launching, and it's taken me quite some time to really figure out what this is all about. The story of this website, you know, goes back actually the public comment website goes back to 2012 before it was public comment. I think at that time it was probably Sean O'Connor Literature. Dot com. Anyway, uh, more on that another time. Just wanted to give you a sort of heads up kind of thing about that. And um, so let's get right to it. Here's what I want to say as a sort of initial thought on the topic of competition. That's this. The more I think about it, the more I actually think about the concepts of honesty and self-knowledge and the concept of uh, niche marketing or niche marketing, and the less I think about competition in general as a sort of prominent and necessary exercise in our lives, though I don't do away with it as a value per se, Though I think it's we've got to have some conversation about exactly the role that competition ought to play for us. Why do I say all of this? Well, I'll give you a really good concrete example, which is the current Democratic primary, right, for the presidential election 2020. Uh, how many people are running for president right now? 10,000. You're running. I'm running. Our parents are running, right? And I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm not a funny person, but actually the truth is the, the joke goes back to my friend Mark Lewis, who told me that he was running for president. Gullible Sean was like, are you really? <laughs> and he laughed and he said, no, but isn't that what everybody's doing now? Right, because we have like 25, I think, um, officially recognized or widely recognized candidates in the Democratic primary, and now one of the things you're hearing from people is that it's like an overwhelming issue, where it's just, I know a lot of people have expressed to me, they feel it's too many people. So we've got this really widespread, intense, crowded competition for president. It's a really good symbol of how deeply competitive our culture is at this time. We live in very competitive times. I know because I applied to go to school for creative writing, and that turned out to be quite a big mistake. Uh, it was too competitive, clearly, and I lost out in the competition. It is what it is, as they say. But it, it's something that I've had to, therefore, wrap my mind around. Why did I lose in the competition? And what is my, you know, what is my assessment of this competition that I participated in? I have also competed three times for political office, so you know I'm experienced in rather aggressive acts of competition. Not athletic, though. And as a podcaster, the competition is overwhelming. All you have to do is go to a podcasting platform and look at the over-inundation of potential podcasts. Look at music. Look at your Netflix. It's People are competing. If you go to the bookstore, Ashley and I were in Princeton yesterday. We were walking by Labyrinth Books, and just the mere experience of looking at the tables outside where they're showcasing some of the books that there's deals on, you couldn't possibly buy, I mean, unless you're super rich, or right? you're not going to buy every single one of those books. But they're all competing for your money. And maybe a large number of them are valid books that are worthy of time. 
Uh, but they must compete for your dollar. If you're even interested in a book, perhaps you would rather consume your media another way, through a podcast, or maybe you prefer movies, or TV, or um, Sudoku. I, I don't know. But competition exists in all different aspects of our lives. But we live in very competitive times right now. So why did I bring up honesty and the niche concept as things that we want to perhaps put next to abstractly as in our contemplations next to competition. Here's a really good example. Pete Buttigieg, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Let me say from the get-go that I like Mayor Pete. I think that intellectually speaking, He's one of the top tier candidates, actually. I like him a lot and think that he would certainly not ultimately serve as a, probably the worst president we could possibly have. I consider him on, I think he's on my top five. So he's, he's up there. Here's the thing, though, and I've expressed this to you before. I have concerns about Pete Buttigieg especially as concerns his quali- his experience and how that impacts the degree to exactly which he is qualified. I mean, context is important here. If Donald Trump were not the alternative to a Democratic candidate, the fact is that I might be much less generous towards Pete Buttigieg. And I'm not saying that as an ageist. It's not so much how old he is, though that is a factor. I mean, he's only like 38 I'm 31. No, I'm 32. No, I'm 33. Oh my God. Oh my God, I'm 33 years old. Do you ever have that kind of moment where you're like, oh my God. (laughs) I am aging and I don't even realize I'm aging. Madonna says time goes by so slowly. That's a bunch of BS sometimes, isn't it? Time goes by slowly when you're not having fun. Time goes fast when you're having fun, right? That's the expression. There is some truth to that. But here's a question for you. If Pete Buttigieg was a little bit more honest with himself and perhaps less disingenuous, wouldn't it be that he would think to himself, well, in fact, I'm really not all that experienced. I may understand intellectually a lot of the important policy questions, and I might even know quite a bit about politics, but in fact, I'm really not all of that experienced in the game of politics. Maybe at this point in time, it might actually be irrational to run for president. Exactly why he is definitely running right now, I don't know, but And I'm not him, so I can't delve into his thought process. It is certainly my opinion at the end of the day. Again, I I do like him. I think he's bright. I would take him over Donald Trump. I like him more than a lot of the other candidates. Though, at the end of the day, I think he should probably not be running for office. And so, as we're contemplating competition, part of it is also honesty. If you're honest with yourself, should you really be in this competition, this particular competition? Not because you're good or bad, but because is it is it appropriate? Do you fit into this particular role that you're competing for, objectively speaking? So I would say that he does not, out of you know, all due respect to him. I'll give, I'll give you myself as another example. And uh, this this is interesting. Sometimes it really just has to do with self knowledge. This is why I did bring up earlier introspection, and but it, that has more to do also with honesty. So I applied for creative writing school, right, and to get the um, teaching assistantship and grants and all of that. And I was very frustrated when I lost out in that competition. Could it be that, in fact, in truth, I'm actually so philosophical that I shouldn't have been seeking to participate in any kind of creative writing program. But if there was something in academia that I really should have participated in, perhaps it should have been philosophy. Perhaps I didn't have an appropriate degree of self-knowledge 
to um, undertake that kind of competition. So the question that we ask ourselves then is, as we're looking for the job we want, or if we're in business, or I don't know, if you're into that girl or into that guy, and you ask yourself, are you being honest fully and self-aware about that which you're competing for or like that which you're going after? I think this is one of the first issues relevant to the question of competition. Uh, then we get into the whole concept of niche marketing or niche marketing. It depends on who you are. It has been pronounced both ways. If you know someone who happens to be an authority on the pronunciation of that word, I mean, by all means, just let us know. But I don't know about that. But actually, niche marketing is very interesting because niche marketing, at least implicitly, corresponds to this idea that we're all unique. All of us. We're all genetically unique. It's, like, it's a scientific fact that we're all unique. And that turns out to work to our benefit, probably, economically, more than this idea that we would all be too much alike. Not to say that we don't, you know, there are, I do believe there are universals. And it could be, as we evolve, that the more niche we get, that the more we actually learn how to universalize our niche-ness aspects or what have you. But let's think about this issue of you know, so-called individuality and how individuality fits into the niche concept or niche concept because they are you know, utterly bound. And it's difficult because it requires this, this whole aspect of individuality first requires self-knowledge. So it's not just about honesty. You, you could be honest with yourself that the sky is blue, right? It's another thing to be honest about who you are. Being honest about who you are also requires the capacity to introspect and know who you are, grow a knowledge of who you are. That is not easy. And certainly one of the criticisms that I would offer our current world of education from preschool through the university level is I'm not convinced that uh, there is much of a good job really helping people discover who they really are. And I think that's unfortunate because I think that to survive in this economy, especially as we know that jobs are going to continue hemorrhaging in a lot of different fields due to automation and these kinds of things. Also, just various funding issues. Uh, if you look at I, what I have learned, for example, very personally, through academia, I mean, the money's just not there. So if part of the context, for example, in me applying for competing in a creative writing competition is that, A, maybe I could have known myself a little bit better and really narrowed my focus on what it was in academia that I maybe most wanted to um, participate in or be part of. But another part of it is the context of the competition, too and knowing the money that's available and that there just isn't. We live, uh, you know, this, a lot of states lean actually very Republican today and the federal government is in a dire, is in dire straits right now under the Trump administration. And even with all that said, we've also got other, people would argue we have other priorities with respect to spending, take for example, healthcare, which is more important at the end of the day, making sure that everybody has healthcare or making sure that everybody has a college education fully funded. I think that the obvious answer is healthcare. B 
because w- what good is all you could potentially learn if you you're not going to live well to be able to experience that so let's pull that back to part of part of self knowledge therefore and part of your experience of individuality is as much um who you are as well as your personal context these are both very impersonal things who you are and your personal context in fact they say that you're supposed to uh, write notes not just outline what you're going to prepare but as you go on because they say giving providing notes for the people who come across your podcast i say this is good who you are your personal context And even that becomes more interesting because I'll just apply myself again here. Perhaps it turns out that academic though I may be, perhaps as I really introspect, I realize I'm actually a little bit more populist than I realized I am or democratic and realize that at least in the context of where academia is today, uh, something that is really only available in its finest to the elite. I'm I'm speaking economically, or those who are well connected. I mean, we saw it. We there was a big scandal with the bribery into was it USC or UCLA? Parents bribing officials so that um, their kids could get into what they believe was a top class university experience. I mean, do we assume that just because that's the case that ended up reported on and discovered that it's not happening elsewhere or that it's also not happening in other ways? And and maybe part of it is just a social reality check. I can't tell you how many times I've been told it's not what you know, but who you know, or more specifically, applying to university uh, people who th- who believe that they can get you in to a particular school because they know you and they will vouch for you. So, Jesus, when you think about competition in that context alone, God forbid you find an opportunity out there that's sort of distant to you in terms of you, maybe you don't know anybody in that... Um, institution, you just don't have the connections, perhaps you're a genius, but that just doesn't matter because people are so anxious about this buddy-buddy system of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours through our connections. Uh, You'd rather preserve that in a sense of power. And this goes back to like, again, competition awareness, competition consciousness. You'd rather remain in power, so you will, what, pacify the people who pressure you into using, you know, connections to advance others forward? And to a degree, maybe it's only understandable that to a degree... Connections are connections, right? Um, If you look at politics, who is it that you're going to appoint to a particular position or to advise you? A lot of people, it's one thing to think of somebody as qualified. It's another to be comfortable with someone and have a working relationship with someone. Therefore, that connection may be what... a prompts you to put that person on your team, bring that person forward on your team. So we're talking about this individuality idea and really identifying both who you are and what your personal context is. But let's think about this now in terms of, like, concrete competitions. I think that probably one of the toughest ways in which we could think about competition is economic. 
I, I think that is the case. Uh, looking for a job. And a lot of people will want a particular job. The acting industry is a fantastic example. And what are we to make of this? Myself, in many respects, I hate competition. And not because I view myself as an inevitable loser. I think even if I were to view myself as an inevitable winner, I'm not sure I would really feel great about competition by mere fact that there will be losers in the, a competition context. There's a really great line by Bob Dylan that I think um, puts it really well. You'll find out when you reach the top, you're on the bottom. Think about that. You find out when you've reached the top, you're on the bottom. What might that mean to you, especially if you have a conscience? Suppose that you were to win the lottery and your world were to change just at the snap of a finger like that and you were to become really wealthy but um, some of the folks that you really loved were to not or people that you saw suffering that you didn't think deserved the impoverished contexts they ended up in that they deserved, you didn't think they deserved it. Um, how do you feel? Or how do you feel about the fact that... Um, just in general, you get treated oh so differently now that you have oh so much money. And people don't see you so much as their friend like they used to. Uh, but they just see your money and they see how um, your favor, you know, your um, being on good terms with you, for them, that's just a sort of like economic opportunity. And how does that change how you feel about yourself and the way you feel about the kinds of relationships that you might want in life? How you become, you, you, you may begin to see yourself as an end to somebody else's competition in a rather um, all-encompassing way. Myself, I tend not to like competition, therefore. However, um, I think it's an overwhelming thing. And again, I think part of it is breaking down the context so that if you really diagnose the essence, if you really analyze the essence of your competition, I think it, um, you can, I think, get rid of some of the weeds there. But I think that the initial experience of the competition is overwhelming. I tell you again, we're in Princeton looking at the bookstore, and I just thought, all of these people claiming to be um, philosophers, or all these people claiming to be the person whose attention so much of the world should have, and I'm competing with these people. And you ask yourself, what's your edge? Or in marketing, some marketing advice that is often posed is, what do you have to offer that others don't have to offer? And what happens when you struggle with articulating that? Then you're in you're in a place of lacking substantive con uh, co confidence. So these other people are able to sort of advance beyond you and you just sort of watch, you know, the winners and you sit back and you feel like the loser. And there's a lot of emotion, therefore, that can transpire as part of the sort of competition experience. And, you know, wh again, whether that's good or bad, is sort of different from the degree to which it's inevitable. There are two t sort of different conversations. One you might argue is sort of a sociological issue or even economic issue. Another, then we get into the ethics and morality and psychology even of it. But here's what I want to propose about it, though. Again, if it follows that we're all sort of unique, 
It does therefore follow that we all have something to offer that no one else has to offer. That part of honing in on individuality or introspection, the importance of introspection, is crucial. Here becomes the more complex part as I think about it. For some of us, it could be easy to identify your uniqueness and how to utilize that economically. For others of us, that may be more difficult because contexts are just so varied. So, you know, it definitely follows that as we're thinking about like market needs and probably where and how this economy needs to advance moving forward, I'm sure we would discover that um, there's probably an entire industry begging to happen. And I've, I've met people who have done this. Um, back when I first tried to self-publish my book, Lovers, Other Stories, and Words, back in 08, 09, uh, I had, did business with a woman I had a business called Darren Clarity, where her whole function was to sort of figure out how to help you distinguish yourself um, in a more spiritual way and showcase that, understanding the sort of niche marketing reality. But the point then is that it is going to become ever more important for there to be specialists out there who help the rest of us identify what makes us both unique and how we can how can we use that uniqueness to generate an income and be of value to as many people as possible and this leads to the conversation about um, from niche thinking to universal thinking though it's not that easy or that simple I'm writing down the note from niche thinking to universal and is it is it possible that um, there are certain niche th thoughts that can't be universal? Can anything be thought of in a universal way? Well, that comes into our sort of next issue, our next topic. So if the first really important thing is to be focused on the role of the individual in contemplating competition. And that part of that is the importance of introspection, understanding who you are and your personal context, and thinking about things not about competition, actually, but your niche and where you fit in. Is that in a context? Is that in a universal context? Or is that in a more segmented context? I want to say hello to Don Porter, who is watching the live stream version of the public comment podcast. Uh, it's always wonderful for people to say hello. Uh, Dawn is someone that I used to work with at the McCaffrey's Market grocery store. And uh, it's been an awesome thing. And it's always wonderful to have people that um, you have known and know to uh, be part of the experience of you growing your um, in your economic activities, your endeavors, your projects. Uh, it's wonderful to have you, Don, here, and I hope that uh, all is well with you. So, again, the question is, okay, suppose then I can find my, my niche, my niche, my niche in life. What if my niche just doesn't relate to anybody else, and I'm stuck in isolation? There are two things that are going to, I think, cause us problems as we navigate through the, this sort of inevitable, for many, uh, issue. I know it's been something that I've contemplated. Uh, that is the fact that we live in a postmodern world. Or it might be that we're actually starting to shed out of a postmodern world, but postmodernism is still alive and well. Um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the postmodern concept, I mean, it boils down to this idea that um, 
there is no truth or truth is utterly relative. What's true for you is true for me. What's true for me is what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. And who are you to tell me what might be true for me? You're just trying to have power over me. I, that's sort of the way of thinking that a postmodernist would have. Then it amounts to a lot of cynicism and a feeling of meaninglessness uh, and a, just a real lot of cynicism. So there's the postmodern aspect of things. There's also the fact that we live in a time where we feel very critical, understandably so and reasonably so, not just of people trying to tell us what's true uh, or not true and how that relates to their power claims over us, but also the question of capitalism and realizing that capitalism has a lot of imperfections from not paying people appropriately to you know, markets not recognizing people properly due to, you know, whacked out ethics and value systems. These are going to become two important issues for us to think about when we think about competition. And uh, people who think in terms of their niches uh, sometimes getting lost in isolation because postmodernism and dogmatic cynicism towards capitalism may lead to isolation. If what's true for you is only true for you, then maybe your theories of truth don't appeal to people. Don't um, people find not conducive to them? Either like on a superficial, practical level, or metaphysically speaking, like maybe what you say is actually just not true. So you could be deluding yourself over and over again and nobody's going to relate to it. So in an economic context, you could see the problem here. It would also be the case then in this postmodern context um, where we, a lot of people feel sort of that it's for them to say what's true for me is true for me, what's true for you is true for you, that me and my ideological group are going to become our own clique and close everybody else out. And we're going to self-sustain economically quite like a, um, like a guild. Postmodernism has some scary um, connections, in my opinion, to like the medieval times where you had guilds you know, where people view things only in the context of their community, their ideological community, their economic community. I am a grunge rock artist. I only want anything to do with people who consume grunge rock and make grunge rock. That's who I am. Case closed. Um, I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, what I have to offer is only for people who are interested in becoming Seventh-day Adventist Christians or who are my fellow Seventh-day Adventist Christians. This is a concern. Politically, I am a Democrat. I just can't deal with Republicans. I'm not even going to bother marketing to Republicans. I'm not even going to bother... Um, trying to appeal to Republicans. That would be another example. The, the example, uh, I'm a nurse. All that really matters to me is the medical world. And, and not even so much from the doctor's perspective, but just the nurse's perspective. I, don't know, I am in horticulture. Only certain aspects of the horticulture world matter to me. I'm interested in marijuana. Only me and the other people interested in marijuana. That's our world. It's our specialization community. So in this postmodern context, where we cling only to those who share the views of truth that we choose to want to believe in, you can see how this causes a lot of isolation and not necessarily conducive to competition, to the best competition. 
I, I would argue that it is bad for competition uh, because it's divisive and it's exclusive. But maybe you feel, and this is where we get into the more capitalistic aspect of it and dealing with the anxieties of competition. Maybe you feel because you're so economically anxious. By the way, I don't want to be misconstrued in any way, shape, or form that by talking about ideological postmodern cliques that I'm anti-union. I'm totally pro-union and think that unionizing is an entirely different concept that has nothing to do with this and is an entirely different conversation for another time. Go unions. Um, different thing. If you feel anxious that um, the world around you is not going to appreciate you and the only people that are possibly going to bolster you economically are those that share your very narrow code, your worldview, then you, be, you see an incentive then, don't you, to be very exclusive and to um, do things that are perhaps unethical in the name of preserving your ideological group. And that could be problematic. One of the things that always attracted me about all the things I have heard uh, from various academics and intellectuals about the University of Chicago is that at the university, and it's on their website too, it's, it's something University of Chicago touts, is that at U Chicago, what they don't want is people who close their minds. That is to say that it's, it's, it's more important that you make an approach to critically thinking about a variety of views and that there isn't this uh, belief in trying to impose much of a, view, of a view beyond critically examining the world of views. Almost a sort of like very Socratic way of thinking about things. And this is something I was found very attractive. There was a time when I had definitely a deeply felt fantasy of applying to the University of Chicago and going because there seemed to be just something about that. Though I don't know that you have to be at that university to appreciate this ethos, participate in this ethos, because it's, it's something that we should all just probably practice. Uh, but ask yourself, as you think about how you are participating in the economy as a consumer or a producer, to what extent is it uh, something that excludes others? And to what extent are you trying to perpetuate your group identity in the name of excluding any other way of thinking or anybody who poses questions to your way of thinking? Because maybe your way of thinking is right, but how do you approach those who question your way of thinking? And to, to what degree is economic anxiety making you cling to your group? Let's think maybe, for example, some aspects of like the Republican issue that we find today, where a lot of people are just too anxious to criticize on the Republican side or just too anxious to criticize President Trump because they fear that they will lose re-election. Now, maybe for some of them, the fear of re-election has to do with like policy consequences. Maybe for others, though, I mean, they have jobs presently in Congress. So maybe for some people, it's an economic anxiety issue where they feel that um, if they are too honest about things, then they will lose their job. So they have to sacrifice their integrity in order to keep their financial gain, in, in order to keep their comp what they perceive is their competitive edge. Hmm. Are they being rational? Are they being constructive? Or are they being 
corrupted by postmodernism and sophistry and cynicism and incorrect attitudes towards capitalism. So, with this postmodern context, what else happens? You may have heard this term, narrow casting. That's part of it, too. Narrow casting, I think, has a few contexts. There is the sort of media context and marketing context where, specifically in media and television programming or entertainment programming, where instead of broadcasting or trying to appeal to everyone or a mass audience, what's our niche audience? What's our target audience? Now, from one point of view, this definitely appears to make sense because, again, we are all unique. And therefore, again, we, we all not only have something to offer, theoretically, to the economy, if we hone in on what makes us unique and how to monetize it, but that also means that um, with a broad spectrum of people out there, then if you are more personal and honest and looking at your own sort of niche aspects, that you're going to appeal to those people who also share similar niche aspects. You're going to appeal to someone in that spectrum of possible kinds of people. And you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble as opposed to trying to appeal to everybody. Oh, this makes sense from a marketing perspective, totally. Even, I mean, God, if you're like on a dating app, right? You want to narrow cast. You know the kind of person that you'd like to date. So by knowing yourself and knowing your interests, it, it makes sense to be like very narrow, obviously, as opposed to saying, well, I just want somebody to love, right, is different than, well, I think this is the kind of person I'd be interested in having a relationship with. But I would also ask, does the issue of narrow casting in the context of trying to address anxieties over competition or offer a solution to competition, is it in itself the solution, or can we add to it? Because my thought is that one of my concerns with the idea of narrow casting goes back to my concerns about postmodernism. That is to say, does narrow casting propagate a sort of exclusivity and divisiveness mentality whereby we're so hyper-focused on only meeting those people who are most going to relate to our niche that we never really see the world beyond us. Or we don't think about how we can reach more people. Or how there could be a wider appeal. Or, to put it in more philosophical terms, really... Um, can what we have to offer have a more universal utility? For example, if you're thinking about like the computer um, and the personal computer, Bill Gates, Microsoft, Steve Jobs, and a lot of their productivity was something that could be very universalized. Everybody should have a computer, right? Everybody should have a television. So the people who sort of innovate, who are the pioneers in certain products, may have this edge in competition because nobody else is making it just like them, and it's the kind of thing that would suit just about everybody. Or is that not the case, right? Because then you think about Apple and how Apple had a design that contrasted, you know, the Bill Gates approach to the personal computer. Their computers are more attractive, for example. More, the you know, the exterior was more aesthetic and therefore was going to attract more of the creative type. 
And is that where we go with this? And do we stay in a world, actually, of narrow casting and uh, niche marketing? Or is there a way to go from niche to universal? Both. And uh, I'm going to talk more about that in the future. I just kind of want to leave the question there for now and certainly get your thoughts. But um, there's really just so much that where we could go with that, that I and only a few minutes left, that I'd rather allow that to, for us to sort of contemplate that. Uh, but aligned with this idea of narrow casting, one more concept, uh, which I read in an article today that I'll, I'll need to link to you, uh, about hyper-personalization, too. And see, this makes things very interesting. So marketers are not only thinking in terms of narrow casting and a niche audience or target audience or target customer, but they're also thinking in terms of the fact that with the technology we have, options, technology can sort of customize the plethora of options that would suit particular individuals based on their nuanced individual uh, preferences and things. And this almost makes you wonder if we actually go beyond the postmodern guild click kind of isolation, do we risk actually becoming something even more frightening? Which is where we all live in our own little world, in our own little bubbles, and can't even relate as much to people who would be in, who would have otherwise been in our groups, our ideological postmodern little groups. Do we become almost too um, self-involved, for a lack of better terms, too lost in ourselves, in this um, market of hyper personalization? Do we begin to think about things so specialized to the individual that we lose touch with our place in a universal context? Or do we not? Or is this just a uh, irrational concern? Or is this something that uh, maybe is being appropriately addressed, but something we want to keep in mind? I want to leave you with that. You know, keep in mind, I try really not to be so much preachy so much as I try to be very contemplative and introspective. Very much so contemplation, I would call my approach very contemplative in that um, I'm really interested in how these things follow as thoughts as opposed to trying to argue too much. I mean, there are things I feel very strongly about, like... Um, democracy and social democracy and ousting Trump from the presidency, things that are just severely um, priority from a political perspective and from a social perspective. Um, but there are other aspects of philosophy that I think are just a matter of um, talking it out through contemplation. So I want to say thank you for your time. And I, I do want to encourage you to um, donate to the and invest in the public comment podcast. You can go to uh, my Patreon page, in fact, to donate. Uh, there are badges available probably below on the website uh, as well. And uh, so I do hope you'd be interested in doing that because it is a competitive world and I have to compete too. And so I have to ask you for your help, uh, quite like as if, if I was running for office and I'm asking for your vote, I'm asking for your economic vote so that I can stay viable in the public discussion. And that's what this whole uh, public comment thing is about. So again, thank you so much. Have a great day. Feel free to learn out more about uh, my approach to philosophy at publiccomment.blog. That's publiccomment.blog. I'm all over social media too, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all these things, uh, WordPress. Okay, have a great day. 
And I definitely look forward to chatting with you soon. And that ends the Facebook uh, live stream aspect of this. We go on for a few extra seconds here in the audio recording. So again, that's over and out. As I like to say, keep it real. Thanks.